proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail a pioneer of the air. The presentation is entitled, Young Man in the Air. It's a story of courage in the unknown vastness of the sky. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment. But first... Young men of America, do you hear that sound? That's the sound of one of America's newest defenders of the American way, an F-89 Scorpion jet, an airplane that travels faster than the speed of sound. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, if you've had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified, you are eligible to become a part of the Jet Age in the aviation cadet training program that the United States Air Force is making available. Visit your United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station as soon as possible and get full information. Don't hesitate. America needs you now. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Young Man in the Air. He bore the remarkable name Thaddeus Sobieski Kulin Court Lowe. He was born on August 20, 1832, in the town of Jefferson, New Hampshire. At the time of his arrival, it was noted by his keen-eyed father that a large flock of wild geese flew over the Lowe homestead. Uh, whether this has any bearing on later events, there's no telling. Thad's father insisted it did, and the geese were never asked. As for Thad geese or no geese, he was interested in one thing right from the start. Thad! Thad, where are you? Thad! <gasps> Thad, is low. You come down off that barn roof this instant! Right away, Mom. No! No, Thad! Don't jump! Thad! <gasps> oh, Thad! Oh, Thad, my poor boy. Are you... I'm all right, Mom. I guess... Umbrella doesn't look so good, though, does it? Why, you bad boy. How dare you jump off the barn roof with your pa's best umbrella? Now, you come into the house this very Ouch. minute. Ouch! Hey, Ma! Ouch! Thad, if the good Lord meant you to fly like a bird, he'd have growed you with wings. He didn't grow you with wings, so you ain't got no business trying to take matters into your own hands. Ow! Oh! Umbrellas don't come cheap. Neither do broken legs. Big boy like you ought to know better. But it appears you don't, so I gotta break oh! your bad habits. <laughs> Got a Jim Dandy. Knew you would. Pa packs a right mean wallet. What you gonna do now? Your pa got an umbrella. Oh, no. I ain't gonna catch a whopping on account of you. Scaredy cat. Ain't crazy like some I know. Jumping off the barn pretending you was a bird? Wasn't pretending no such thing. I ain't a bird and I know it. Like pa said when he was walloping me. I ain't got wings. I tried flat my arms, but I guess you need feathers. And I can't flap hard enough no matter how I try. Well, then what are you trying to be? Just trying to be me. Last time we had a big storm, I seen Parson Wilson walking along Maple Hill. The wind was a-blown lickety-split. Parson had a big umbrella just like Pa's. I seen the wind come along and lift him right off his feet. I figured it must have been the wind and the umbrella. I heard the Parson tell Mr. Hennicutt he thought he was going right up to heaven. But I knowed it was the wind. How'd you know? Well, I ain't blind. I could see. 
If the wind hadn't blown the umbrella inside out, old whistle would have been flying right through the air. That what made you jump off the barn? Yep. Figured if the parson go flying up, I could come flying down. Didn't work, though, did it? Well, I came down all right. What you gonna do now? Well, you won't get your pa's umbrella, so I'm gonna build one. A big one. Maybe with a big one, I won't come down so hard. Your pa will give you another whooping for sure. Yep. Figure he will. <laughs> And uh, no doubt he did many times, because even at age 10, Thaddeus Sobieski Coolant Court Low had a stubborn streak in him that could put most mules to shame. And even at age 10, he was on the track of what was to be a most amazing career. Whether any of Thad's homemade umbrellas brought him down off the barn with any greater ease than a bag of cement, we don't know. But we do know he survived both jumps and weapons because we find him next some years later on a lovely day in July in Ottawa, Canada. M Mr. Robertson? Uh, quite. I'm Thad Lowe. Uh, did you say Shad Rowe? Uh, no, sir. No, uh, Thad Lowe. L-O-W-E. Oh, I see. Well, that's very nice. Mr. Robertson, I wrote you a letter when you were in London... I said that I... Oh, my word. That is low. Yes, sir. My dear boy, please forgive me. That's all right. I've been seeing so many people since I came to Canada, I just couldn't connect you for a moment. Well, 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 this is a surprise. What do you say we go up to my room and talk? Well, that'll be wonderful, sir. I was most interested in your theory on air currents. But Mr. Robertson, are, are you planning to make an ascent in your balloon this afternoon? Oh, yes, 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 quite. Going to have the big crowd. I find big crowds aboard, don't you? Mr. Robertson, could you... Would... Would you, would you take me up with you? Take you up? Take you up? Well, of course, my dear boy. It'll be a pleasure. Most impressed with your theory on air currents. Although Thad had many theories, some of them very good, it's not thought he had any particular ones on air currents. However, on July 17, 1858, he made his first balloon ascension. He knew as he stood in the balloon's basket with the noble Mr. Robertson and watched the earth and many open mouths fall away that he had found the answer to his many dreams, which added up to building and flying his own airship. Mr. Tom, they said that you were a man of vision, a man who could see beyond the backwardness of yesterday and the apathy of today. They did? Who did? Why, everyone I talked to, they all said J.T. Tom is your man. He's... He's got money to burn. He's got money... No, no. Uh, uh, let, let's 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 stop this nonsense. Ah, it's the first sensible word you've said since you got in here. I heard that you were at the exhibition I gave yesterday. Did you also hear that I was trying to raise enough money to build a balloon big enough to travel across the Atlantic Ocean? Yeah, I heard it. I can't do it without money. You want to break your full neck? It's my neck. My money. I've only got one neck. <laughs> Sit down, boy. Have a cigar. All right, tell me more about this crazy idea. I got rich on a bushel of them. It's going to be the biggest balloon ever built because I believe the larger the gas bag, the longer I'll be able to stay up. Oh, what would be its gas capacity? 725,000 cubic feet. Yeah. It's a lot of gas in one bag. Well, sir, when, it, when it's filled, it'll be 200 feet tall, 104 feet in diameter. It'll have a lifting power of about 22 and a half tons. You don't say. Well, what, do you, what do you plan to make this thing out of? A uh, twilled cloth, which will be oiled and covered with a special type of varnish. Now, the basket will have a framework with a canvas covering. There will be windows in the sides of it. <laughs> Sounds cozy. And, and, and beneath the carriage, there'll be a 30-foot steam-powered lifeboat in case we should be unsuccessful. Well, I should... We? Yes, yes, sir. I, I thought I'd take along several scientists, a congressman from my home state, a New York editor, and one or two others. Would you like to come? Young man, at my stage of life, I can't be bothered risking my full neck. I can put up money to give others the opportunity, but I'm too comfortable and I'm too fat sitting right here smoking good cigars, admiring pretty women. Then, then you'll put up some money. Sit down, young man, before you fly up into the chandelier. Now, I don't convince that easily. I want to know a lot more about this... This thing. Evidently, Thad was almost as spectacular convincing the hard to convince as he was at going up in balloons because the money was advanced and the huge airship constructed. It raided headlines in all the New York papers, 
and Thad, with a certain New England sense for choosing the most popular name, called his ship City of New York. The great adventure was scheduled to start sometime near the end of November 1859. But alas, a voice crying in the wilderness momentarily brought matters to a halt. Extra, extra, read all about it. Gas company can't fill Lowe's balloon. Extra, extra. Now, what's that small barbarian screaming about? It's true, Mr. Tome. The New York Gas Company can't deliver hydrogen fast enough to bring about full inflation of the balloon. Oh, that's impossible. I own that company. I think. You can't do this to me. I'll have the whole lot of them fired. Does that mean I spent all this money just to find you out progress, progress? There must be another gas company bigger than the one here. Ah, seems to me there is. Seems to me that I own one or two of them. Huh. Mr. Filbert, make a check on my home. It may have been that Mr. Tome owned more gas companies than he could keep straight. But it was Dr. John C. Cresson, president of the Franklin Institute and the Point Breeze Gas Works of Philadelphia, who temporarily came to the rescue, inviting Thad to bring the city of New York to the city of brotherly love and have a go at blowing it up. But every time they blew up the balloon, the wind blew up too. And finally, with snow in the air and the wild geese heading south, Thad came to a pretty rough decision. Mr. Tom. Not another cent. Oh, it's, it's not more money I want. Sir. I would. You sick, boy? I feel kind of sick, sir. Well, go see a doctor and stay away from me. I'm calling off operations until the spring. Well, spring's a nice time to give it. You what? We'll have to wait until spring. The weather's gotten too bad. It's too risky. I thought you weren't afraid of a little risk like crossing the ocean by air. Oh, it's not me I'm worried about. It's a balloon. In this kind of weather, it could be damaged beyond repair. Ah, uh, hmm. that would cost a lot of money and make me look foolish in the first place for putting up so much in the second place. Yes. Yeah. All right, spring it is. And spring it was that Thad tried again and made an initial flight on June 28, 1860. But it wasn't until September the 8th that the final inflation for the long flight began. It was almost completed when a sudden gust of wind came along and... His airship, the city of New York, was a shambles. At that point, so were Thad's plans and his pocketbook. But Mr. Tome was very understanding. Well, now, I'll give you an idea of the bubble and turn around and beg me to. I can promise you it from now on, you'll have to come forward with the I have no intention of helping you with either money or moral encouragement. And so Thad went to see Joseph Henry of the Smithsonian Institute for advice. Oh, I'm sorry to read of your bad luck, Mr. Lowe. Well, I guess we all have to have a run of that sometime, Mr. Henry. Mm. Well, how can I help you? After I've gotten some new backers, I'm going to build another balloon. The, the other one was too big. It was too clumsy. This one will be about half the size. Mm, I think that's a wise decision. I came to you because you're the best-known authority in the country on aeronautics. I want your frank opinion. What do you think my chances are for succeeding at this venture? Well... Not easily answered, Mr. Lowe. Many factors to take into consideration. Many things that can happen. But I do think there's a good possibility you can succeed because of the prevailing wind currents. But there's one thing I'd suggest. Start the first leg of your journey inland. Make it a flight to the coast. That way, you'll have time to see how things are working out. And if they're not working out, at least you'll be able to come down on dry land. <laughs> With a set of new financiers, none of them related to Mr. Tome, Thad headed for Cincinnati with his new and smaller balloon to await favorable weather conditions. He was at a banquet being given in his honor on the night of April 19, 1861. Oh, there you are, Mr. Lowe. I've been looking everywhere for you. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hastings. Uh, is there something to the matter? Well, there's a man at the door who says you must come at once. That it's a perfect night I, for... I beg your pardon, Mrs. Hastings. You'll excuse me now. It was a fine oh. party. I enjoyed it so much. I have to go now. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Uh, Mr. Lowe. Oh, everybody. Everybody, please listen. I think Mr. Lowe is... Uh, he, he's going to go up in the air. Now, uh, please, 
please, please don't crowd around. Keep back, everybody. Uh, if everything's ready, Jack, I'll get aboard. Don't waste time releasing me. This crowd is getting bigger. They're up to damage the ship. Yeah. Uh, please, 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 folks, don't crowd in. Okay, Jack, let her go. Quick. You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Young Man in the Air. Our story will continue in just a moment after this timely message. music in the background is recognizable to anyone as the song of the United States Air Force. Its words ring with the mighty story that began in the era of the flying quivers and continues in the modern jet age. Newer planes mean newer techniques, which in turn must be taught to the new generation. Here is your opportunity, young men of America, and a chance to strengthen the defense of the nation as part of the great Air Force team. Enlist now in the Aviation Cadet Training Program. You have the preliminary qualifications if you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half and have had at least two years of college. Inquire today at your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Ask about the Aviation Cadet Training Program. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Young Man in the Air. Thad's takeoff time was 3.30 on the morning of April 20th. Without the physical characteristics of a bird, he nevertheless rose like one and went sailing merrily eastward and somewhat to the south on what was to be the first leg of his transatlantic flight. His landing took place near the northern border of South Carolina about one o'clock that afternoon, where he was greeted warmly by a group of local citizens. Mister, where you come from in that there contraption? From Cincinnati, and I'll thank you to keep back all of you. You see this here squirrel gun? can shoot mighty mean. You can see this re Colt revolver right here. It can shoot mighty mean, too, and five times as fast. Now, get back, all of you. <laughs> Yankee spy, that's what I'll bet you be. Spy? What kind of nonsense is that? I'm Thaddeus Lowe, and I'm on my way across the Atlantic Ocean. You hear that, fellas? Don't that beat all? <laughs> What's the matter with you people? Ain't nothing wrong with us that hanging you won't fix. Hang it! But what have I done? Well, the first thing you've done is to be born a Yankee. And the second's coming down here spying on us folks. And the third is carrying concealed weapons. There's nothing concealed about this, stranger. I demand to speak to the authorities here. And get down out of that thing right smart and come along peaceable. Crazy fool, he don't seem to know there's a wall. <laughs> No, Thad didn't know there was a war on, but he found out soon enough when the good people of Unionville, South Carolina, threw him in a jail and proclaimed him their first prisoner. You can't do this to me! Let me out of here! I demand my rights! I'm not a belligerent! Don't you see? I'm a balloonist! If you don't shut up, you'll be a dead Yankee. Let me get my hands around your throat and we'll see about that. Got a right smart temper, ain't you? You let me out of this jail! Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Just when things looked the blackest for Thad, the local hotel keeper, a man of influence and stature in the town, and a man who had once made a balloon ascension with Thad, came to the rescue. Our enterprising hero was released from jail, and after some rigid cross-examining, was sent back to Cincinnati. By the time he reached there, actual hostilities had broken out, and Thad gave up plans for his trip to do something he figured was a lot more important. General, 
I, I should like to give a demonstration to you and, and to other officials of how valuable the balloon can be to the winning of this war between the states. I, j just think of it, sir. From the air, I can report enemy troop movements. I, I can direct your artillery. I, I can be an invaluable pair of eyes to any army and a source of constant worry to the enemy. <laughs> On June 11th, Thad talked with President Lincoln. A few days later, the War Department appropriated a sum not to exceed $250 for a demonstration. On June 18th, accompanied by a telegraph official and an operator, Thad rose 500 feet over the Capitol and there, by wire, sent the first message ever transmitted from the air. Balloon Enterprise, June 18. 1861 to the President of the United States. Sir, this point of observation commands an area nearly 50 miles in diameter. The city with its girdle of encampments presents a superb scene. I have pleasure in sending you this first dispatch ever telegraphed from an aerial station and in acknowledging indebtedness for your encouragement for the opportunity of demonstrating the availability of the science of aeronautics in the military service of this country. Signed, T. S. C. Lowe. After several false starts, Thad was authorized to construct a new balloon of 25,000 cubic feet capacity. The work was done in less than a month. And from August 29th until October the 1st, Thad spent most of his time up in the air, watching the Confederate forces building fortifications not far from Washington. On September 24th, ordered to Fort Corcoran, Thad racked up another first in the history of military warfare. Signal our artillery that that last salvo is 200 yards short and still to the left. Oh, by gum, I said I could direct artillery fire from a balloon, and I can. That, that's it. Tell them to hold that range. That'll chase them out. On September 25th, an important milestone in our military history was reached. I've received orders from the Secretary of War to construct four more balloons. We're going to have a regular balloon corps. And so began what might be called the first United States Air Force. Under Thad's direction, a total of seven balloons operated with the Union armies during the next two years. There were many failures, much red tape, and a great many generals who thought low and his airships a nuisance. But Thad was used to rebuffs, and there were some military leaders who realized his services were extremely valuable. Well, Thad, I'm ready if you are. General Porter, do you think you should risk going up with me now? The enemy's advancing. And I want to put a stop to it, and maybe if I can see what's going on out in front, I can. So come on with you. Yes, sir. All right, slack off on the line. Wonderful. Right up like a bird. You better keep down, sir. They're close enough to shoot at us. Where are they? Well, they're all along the river, back, sir. They're starting across. And, sir, sir, they're shooting at us. Young man, don't you think I know when I'm being shot at? Signal for Carter's regiment to move up in support of the third. Magnificent. Absolutely magnificent. Well, you can see the whole battle. Win it right from up here. A uh, signal for Smith to bring up his artillery on that ridge and to start shelling the riverbank. Well, tell him to hurry. Well, signal. What's happened? Our lines are broken, so we're in free flight. Well, what do we do now? I I'd release some gas and we'd come down, but the wind is drifting us over Confederate lines. Excellent. Excellent. Use your flag signals. Signal McIntyre to take command. Tell them the Rebs only have two regiments in reserve. 
hold them at the river, and then attack. We seem to be going up rather high. We are, sir. I, I've got to find some air currents to blow us back inside our lines. Yes, do that by all means. We mustn't be taken prisoners. Never do. It's very exhilarating up here, though. Fine idea. It was a fine idea, and as long as the Union Army retained Thad and his fellow balloonists, their achievements in observation, in spying out enemy troop movements, and directing artillery fire far outweighed their failures. When the war was over, Thad went home to see his folks. Well, you look fit, son. Spry and fit. Oh, I'm fine, Pa. Seems all we know about you today, Thad, is what we read in the papers. Oh, I've been awful busy, Ma. Yeah, sure you have, son. <laughs> <laughs> Flapping your wings. <laughs> Thad, it's high time you come down to earth and got yourself married like other folks. Now, Ma, I'll do all that in plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, son, I've often wondered what you'd have been like if them geese hadn't flown over the house just when you was born. <laughs> Why, I imagine I'd be just the same, Pa. Oh, I ain't so sure. <laughs> I just ain't so sure. I hear tell of the time. As for the influence of geese, you'll have to make up your own minds, because it wasn't long before Thad took his mother's advice, got married, came down to earth, and became a success on the ground. Nevertheless, it was Thaddeus Sobieski, cool and court low, who proudly we hail for giving us our first Air Force nearly a hundred years ago. Young men of America, answer your country's call today. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have had two or more years of college, and are otherwise qualified, you are urgently needed to take your place with the United States Air Force as an aviation cadet. You'll play a leading part in the drama of the jet age. As an aviation cadet, you'll get the finest flight training in the world. You'll feel proud of your silver wings while piloting the new jets of your United States Air Force. See your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today for full particulars. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Bureau for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>